All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm an educational specialist here at IRIS. And I'm Casey Jones. I'm a client success manager here at IRIS. And we are joined today by Dr. Ron Gross. Hi, Ron. Welcome. Uh, so the purpose of this webinar is to uh, help providers and administrators and camera operators who are utilizing the IRIS program better understand the program from a perspective of a practicing ophthalmologist. Uh, Dr. Gross is a practicing ophthalmologist and also the CMO uh, at IRIS. Uh, Ron, did you want to uh, tell us anything more about yourself today? No, I, I mean, I'm, I, I see patients all the time. I'm, I'm an active clinician. Um, but as as Lauren said, I, I've been chief medical officer at, at Iris uh, since uh, 2018, um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of your questions today. All right. Well, we're excited to have you, and we're looking forward to uh, going ahead and getting started with fielding those questions. Uh, so few housekeeping reminders before we get started. Everyone is on mute, but we do welcome questions. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and you're welcome to utilize that at any time to ask any questions that you might have. Um, if your questions are a little more program specific or something we can't address during the webinar, we'll be able to follow up with you afterwards. So don't hesitate to put any questions that you want to in that box, and we'll do our best to answer those live. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn it over to Casey. Yeah, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, so we're just going to start off by asking Dr. Gross some questions that um, that we hear all the time from our clients. So, so some of the things that you're probably wondering already. Um, and start, Dr. Gross, with um, why would an eye specialist want to do this exam um, in a primary or have this exam done in a primary care office or in the home rather than uh, just having it referred to them? Um, good question. Um, a couple of things. Um, one is that um, this is not meant to replace an eye exam by an eye care professional. Um, this is, is just a fundus exam, primarily looking at diabetic retinopathy, but also trying to uh, at least identify you know, pathology that could be suspicious for other things as well, like glaucoma, cataracts, and the like. Um, so first, it's, it's not meant to replace a live exam. Uh, the second part is, is that realistically, in many areas, access to eye care is not as easy as it could be, um, and people are very busy, and it may be an extended wait, and that may be one reason why patients aren't seeing the, the eye doctor like they should. Um, additionally, um, we have patients who just, you know, that extra visit is, an, is, is, is a barrier. So the whole idea here really is to make it as simple for the patient, uh, as convenient for the patient. Uh, to be able to get the assessment because diabetic retinopathy is is the leading cause of blindness among working aged Americans. And we know that uh, at least 50% uh, of people who should get their evaluation every year don't. So it's just giving them another tool in the box that they can that you can reach for as a primary care provider that will allow you to be able to successfully get the exam done and not insignificantly get a report back for yourself to prove that it was done as well. Okay. Um, so what do you think the best way to present this evaluation to a patient is, um, you know, a patient that's not familiar with this exam? Um, I, I think, the you know, from, from, from my perspective, the thing is to say, we're, we're simply taking a picture of the back of your eye. It actually will do a very good job of, assuming we get a good picture, um, we will, it does a very good job of determining if uh, you have diabetic retinopathy or any diabetic changes in your eye. Um, and how severe those are. And it gives us a way to be able to decide how best, if something is found, how best to take care of you and where you should go and what you should do next. Um, it, it's not meant to replace, you know, it's not going to give you a pair of glasses. It's not going to replace, a, you know, a full eye exam. Uh, but the whole idea here is to be able to make sure that at least from this, the, the perspective of diabetes, that we're doing everything that we can to, to get you evaluated to make sure that we minimize your risk of any vision loss now or in the future. Thank you. So um, we know that we a lot of our clients get pushback or resistance from patients that don't want to have the exam while they're there. Um, what would you say to a patient that, that doesn't want to have the exam? Kind of the old, you can see me now or you can see me later. 
Um, if you, you know, I understand it's it's more in your exam here. Um, if you're going to go see your eye doctor anyway, great. You got no problem with that. Um, but if you don't, and you don't have any evaluation, we know that almost everybody with diabetes will eventually get diabetic retinopathy if they live long enough. And if we, th there's no question that it's earlier, the earlier you find it, the easier it is to treat, the more likely that your treatment will either reverse or prevent any vision loss. Um, and if you ignore it, it's all, you know, you're putting yourself at risk for permanent vision loss and having much more severe disease. Um, we can't, you know, this is compared to having to make another appointment, pay another copay. This is pretty darn convenient. Much agreed. Uh, so one of the common questions we get from our clients is uh, around wondering whether there are any patients who should not have an iris exam. Um, realistically, if they've had an, you know, an eye, a, a dilated eye exam by an eye care professional within the calendar year, uh, then there's really no reason to do it, uh, assuming that you've gotten that report. Um, it, you know, again, there are kind of two sides to this. Uh, but if you have the report, they either have or will see their eye care professional. There's no reason that 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 will fulfill both sides of the clinical and the, 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 the quality um, issues. However, if those are not the case, then there's really no reason not to. Um, there's some concern, you know, very rare concerns over potential if you have to dilate the patient that maybe that that can cause acute glaucoma. Uh, given the way that we suggest dilating, um, that really is, is incredibly minuscule in its risk. So realistically, unless, you know, at some point in time in the patient's life, some eye doctor has told them, no matter what happens, don't ever let anybody dilate your pupils. Um, it's perfectly fine to do this exam on anyone. So there are no contraindications. Great. Not really. All right. Uh, so kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, what, uh, what happens when diabetic retinopathy is left untreated? As, as we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, uh, diabetes, diabetic retinopathy is the same as every other end organ effect of the, of the diabetes. It affects large blood vessels. It affects small blood vessels. Um, and, un, you know, inadequately treated uh, as far as the diabetes is concerned. The, the, the flip side of this is no question, the better they control their sugars and the better they control their disease, the less risk that they're going to have eye problems and kidney problems and all the other problems that, that patients with diabetes have. Uh, but untreated, and the more out of control it is, the longer you have it, the worse it is. And as I said, this is the leading cause of blindness and uh, visual um, um, impairment among working aged Americans, because the natural history of the disease is if you live long enough, and if the disease is bad enough, it, it eventually can lead to blindness. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's say a patient gets the exam, the results come back and they're positive for, for diabetic retinopathy. They're referred to an eye care specialist. What are typically the, the next steps once they get referred? Typically they'll see the, they'll see the doctor and it depends on whether they're gonna see a comprehensive ophthalmologist or, or a retina specialist. But basically they'll have a full eye exam. That's you know first to confirm that yes, what, what was suspected or what was found is, is truly there. Um, the second is, is it of the type that, that is affecting their vision? And if it is either affecting their vision or potentially can affect their vision, the good news is there are now treatments that can minimize that risk or actually reverse any vision loss they may have experienced from the, the diabetic retinopathy. As I said earlier, the, er, the, 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 the earlier in the, in the disease that you find that, the more amenable it is to treatment. Um, and people with very late, severe proliferative disease, that may not be reversible. Um, that may be resulting in permanent vision loss. Uh, but now, whereas um, 10 years ago, basically, we could maybe keep it from getting any worse. Um, now, with the medications that we have now, we're able to actually improve vision uh, and make it better. And it's amazing. Um, and they're getting better and better all the time. Currently, for most people, the initial treatment is actually a, a, an injection into the eye of medication. Um, again, initially, when we first started doing this, it, it could just stabilize. It could not make it better. The newer medications actually make it better. And increasingly, they're becoming better to where the uh, how good they are at, at reversing the, the diabetic changes 
is, in, is always improving. And then the duration between the injections that you need is always extending. So with the, the tools are just continue to get better. But the good news really is if you find it early enough in, in way over 90% of cases, the, 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 the loss of vision is reversible with appropriate treatment. That's great. All right. So um, as many people who are using the program already know, uh, there are other types of pathologies that can be identified in an iris exam. Can you talk about some of the other things that can be identified? Sure. Um, what we're doing is taking a picture of the retina and realize that the retina is full of blood vessels. Uh, it is full of neural tissue. Um, today, I must admit, we're just starting to be able to, to use it to its full capability. Uh, but right now, um, diabetic retinopathy, there are multiple studies that have shown that if you compare a good picture with telemedicine like we do with a live exam, it actually compares very favorably. It, it, there, there's really equal sensitivity and specificity and accuracy. Um, but there are other things on other than diabetic retinopathy that can affect the eye that we can identify, things like glaucoma. Um, we can look at the optic nerve and assess that. Um, again, we can't make the diagnosis, but we can have see the pathology that makes us very suspicious. Other things that can affect their vision, like vein occlusions and macular holes and epiretinal membranes, these are all diseases of the retina that, again, we can see from the picture. Those, those can be suspected as well. Um, the, interestingly, just we're start, just starting really to be able to look at systemic disease. Um, hypertension, systemic hypertension can cause changes of the retina that we see, but increasingly um, there's, uh, there's data that looking at cardiovascular disease, hypertension, even things like Alzheimer's, strokes, um, because the, 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 the retina is neural tissue and vascular tissue, any disease that has an underlying vascular problem or an underlying neurologic problem, potentially we're going to be able to be able to assess in a non-invasive manner, just looking at the at the fundus. That's fascinating. It's so, going to be cool. Yes, yeah. Uh, I have, I did not know that, so I'm learning <laughs> right along with our attendees. Um, so you you touched on this a little bit, but I do kind of just want to dive in just a little bit more on why a finding would sus display as suspected on an iris exam result instead of as a diagnosis, the way diabetic retinopathy does. Okay. Um, diabetic retinopathy is defined by pathologic changes in the retina, which we can see and we can identify. Um, let's take, I'm, I do glaucoma, so let's talk about glaucoma. Um, glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve, which is part of the, we can get a picture of it. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a, a definitive appearance of the optic nerve that can make the diagnosis. There's other testing that's required to make sure that that's the case. Um, so that's really the reason things are suspected. Things like a cataract. Cataracts cause the whole image to be blurry. Well, there are many other things that could cause the whole image to be blurry as well. A lens being dirty, the, being slightly out of focus and the like. So it is suspicious for that. But unless they have an examination that's, that goes into more detail, there's no way to know for sure that's the case. Thank you. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit um, now as well. Uh, some of our clients choose to use dilation drops when doing these exams, and some choose not to. Um, I'm wondering why would an organization want to use dilation drops as opposed to relying on natural dilation? Okay. Um, the whole reason that we're able to be successful with this for the most part is that the, their technology is advanced to give us cameras to give us good pictures through kind of normal size pupils. Um, if you're a camera person, you know that the the, the f-stop, the size of the aperture makes a big difference in how much light can come into the eye. And that's what your natural pupil does. Um, and the problem is in some people, they either naturally or for other reasons have very small pupils. And it's difficult to get an adequate picture through that pupil. Your options at that point are to suffice with an inadequate poor picture that really isn't going to answer the question or to dilate the pupil and make it bigger. Um, the concern historically with dilating is that there are some logistical things that you have to take care of, because you know obviously you have to put the drop in and wait a little bit of time for that to have the effect. Uh, but people typically are concerned about acute 
angle closure glaucoma. Uh, I'm a glaucoma specialist. I, I know about that. The good news is with the with the the, the dilation um, uh, medication that we suggest, to be real honest, there's essentially no risk. Um, there are papers out there that have done tens of thousands of patients without any problems. Um, the, typically, when you're dilated at the eye care at the eye doctors, we use a much stronger and use multiple medications to dilate it, dilate the pupil, so we can make get the pupil as big as possible. We don't need it for this. We don't need a huge pupil. We just need it uh, of sufficient size to be able to get an adequate image. And in most cases, assuming everything else is okay, if you can make, get the pupil big enough, it will allow you to get an adequate image. And, and and make it so that that patient doesn't have to have a, 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 an additional visit to the eye care professional. Okay. All right, perfect. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and shift gears one last time. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about gradeability. So uh, Dr. Gross, I know you've interpreted a lot of images in your time here at Iris and uh, certainly before that as well. Um, and so we talked about um, going through a few of the types of images um, and gradeability issues that you might run into um, so that uh, they can better understand what you need to see in an image to successfully interpret it. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to our slideshow so that we can uh, talk a little bit more about image quality and gradeability. Okay, so this is this is a great picture. It's 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 got great clarity. Uh, everything's there. Um, things uh, I can't. So um, what do we look for? We what we when we're grading, basically, if we see pathology, no matter where it is, it makes it that 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 answers the question and tells us what's going on. What we really do is need to have be able to see enough to be sure that there's no pathology there, that we're not missing anything. And this is the type of image that that is ideal. It, it, it's really well done. Can we go back? Um, and, and let me define. On the left-hand side, about uh, nine o'clock, you'll see a little white. That's the optic nerve. That's actually the nerve tissue that connects the eye with the brain. That is, we want to be able to see that both to suspect glaucoma, but also there are some diabetic changes that can occur there as well. The retina is, is supplied with blood through the blood vessels that you see coming out of the top and the bottom of that. And really, um, all the vast majority of your useful vision, um, the retina is like the film in the camera. And the what you see here is only maybe... 15 or 20% of your entire retina, but it's the most important part. That little dark area in the center is called the macula. At the very center of that is a pinpoint called the fovea. And all your reading vision is at that single point. And if that single pinpoint is gone, you can't even see the big E, despite everything else being okay. So we need to really be able to focus and be able to see well what's going on there. And then we wanna see enough of the vision around that, um, the retina that represents that vision. So the, the blood vessels that come out that you see on the top of the bottom are called the arcades, the vascular arcades. And as long as we can see those things, that gives us a very good idea that we can assess the important part of your vision and where diabetic retinopathy typically has the most impact, okay? So seeing everything makes it easily gradable. Question is, what happens when it's not all there or we can't see it? Absolutely. Now you go to the next. Yep, we've got a few more examples. So okay. this is a pretty common one we see a lot. Right. On the left, you can see one. Uh, on the left, you can see on the right-hand side is the optic nerve. You can't see the detail nearly as good. You can't see the, the vascular arcades. Everything's very dark in the macula. We just can't see enough to be sure that there's no diabetic retinopathy there. The one on the right looks a little bit better. There's a little bit of an area there superiorly that you can see, but again, we don't know what's going on in that whole area inferiorly. And even in the macula, that dark area in the center, you see part of it, but you don't see the whole thing. So again, for us to be able to say that everything in this image would be normal, we just can't do that. We don't see enough of it to be able to make that assessment. 
All right, next example. Next example, that's a great picture of the optic nerve, but it, you can see that it's in the center, whereas normally it's to one side or the other, depending on which eye, and we don't have the macula. And as I said, the macula here would be just off the right right hand side of the picture. And as I said, that's the most important part because that's all your reading vision is, where all your reading vision is. And if we can't see it, we can't assess it to know if it's if it's um, normal or not. So that's the reason we that that's what's called a a, a an optic disc centered vision centered image, but not very useful to us. Um, on the right, you can see the top half looks pretty good. Uh, the problem is the bottom half is okay, uh, is not okay. And under these circumstances, again, we can presume that the top looks good and there's no pathology, but we can't presume the same thing inferiorly because we just can't see to know. And diabetic retinopathy can be can be sporadic throughout the, the, the retina. So unless we can see it all to know that it's okay, we can't um, define that to be the case. So here we were missing the inferior part, which is gone. On the left, we were missing the macula. Again, we just don't see enough to be able to know that this is normal. Absolutely. Next. And here's one that's the nerve is on the right, the macula is kind of there in the middle, but it's so blurry that we really can't see. Uh, when we talk about the early changes in diabetic retinopathy, they're very small, smaller than you would be able to resolve with this type of, uh, of, of image. So it's got to be clear and it's got to have all the anatomy. And, and the better the image, the more complete the image, the better the quality of our grade can be. Absolutely. All right. This last slide, we wanted to talk a little bit about images that happen to be gradable because pathology is present. And so we've got a okay. few examples. Perfect. So starting from the left, again, just like the ones before, the whole inferior part is gone. So, oh, it's ungradable. Except when you look right above that, you see right in the center, right above it, there's that those little yellow dots. And that's diabetic retinopathy. That's caused by leakage from the blood vessels in the retina with deposits of lipid, of fat, in the retina itself. So even though the image itself isn't very good, within the parts that we can see, there's pathology. So this would be gradable and we would be able to give a result this patient needs to be seen because, again, it's sitting right next to the macula, and this is probably affecting this patient's vision. In the middle is one where instead of the optic nerve, that white disc being at the right or the left, it's down at the bottom, which means we're seeing the superior part of the retina, but not the inferior. But in that, you see those big red splotches, and those are hemorrhages. That's bleeding from the vessels of the eye, again, due to leakage of the blood vessels, damage to the blood vessels from diabetes. And even though we can't see the macula very well, we still know that there's diabetic retinopathy there and that you know this patient has disease and should be fully evaluated. Um, on the right, um, again, lots are missing, but if you look way over to the left, you'll see some yellow, some more yellow stuff. And those little yellow splotches, again, are exudates, are, are deposits within the retina, that though the image itself is not great, that we see enough. So the advantage of a human reading this is that we can say, whoop, there is, you know, in the areas that we do see, we can identify damage and allow us to, to take care of this patient correctly, rather than saying it's ungradable and sending them for an evaluation that would, de that would delay their ability to be treated. Absolutely. And that really speaks to something I know we talk a lot about when we do training is you know, an image is better than none. So even if an image is not ideal, it's better to submit the best images you can capture. Obviously we want an ideal image, but, um, you know, submitting what you're able to capture gives you or the other interpreting providers the chance to see anatomy and make a determination on whether there's any pathology present. Something's better than nothing. Absolutely. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Uh, so just a reminder to our attendees that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen is open if anyone would like to submit any questions. We have already received a few. So uh, Dr. Gross, the first question uh, is regarding treatments. Uh, so the attendee wants to know, is diabetic retinopathy treated similarly to wet or dry macular degeneration? Yes and no. Um, um, dry macular degeneration, 
we're just starting to investigate. And, and actually, there is one drug that's been approved, um, but it, it's very new. It just within the last month or two, uh, the same type of medications that are used to treat diabetic retinopathy are also used to treat wet macular degeneration. Um, they're, they're, they are intravitreal, they're injections into the vitreous of the eye. For diabetes particularly, there are other treatments that are also sometimes used. Um, steroids um, can be very effective in some people. Um, again, usually given in the eye itself. Also laser treatment, depending on what exactly is the, the severity of the glaucoma, or excuse me, the severity of the retinopathy. Um, can also be be used. So we have more tools for diabetic retinopathy than, than we do for wet macular degeneration. But the kind of the mainstay of both is still intravitreal injections of, of anti-vascular endothelial growth factor medications. All right. Uh, another question we've received uh, is regarding uh, our interpreting providers in the Iris Reading Center. Uh, so this person's wondering, how are those providers uh, vetted? I don't know how much involvement you have in that process, but whatever you can speak to. Unfortunately, a lot, or fortunately, a lot. <laughs> um, uh, what we do now is for any new provider, after they've done a, a fair number, actually, I'm in the middle of doing somebody right now, uh, even as we speak, um, I go back and review about 100 of their interpretations, and then we compare what I look, see, compared to what they say, and validate that yes, they're that that you know nobody's perfect, but they're really really good. And we 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 expect and we require way over ninety percent agreement in order for for us to continue to use them. So yes, we do do a quality um, assessment um, usually within ninety days or so after they start. Um, obviously, we vet them to make sure that they're. For the most part, they're retina specialists that are well trained. We, you know, go through all those things and vet them from that basis. But we also look, vet their actual performance. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question regarding the dilation. Um, so a little bit more clarification regarding uh, patients who either have glaucoma or might have glaucoma. Um, so the they're wondering, um, Dr. Gross, are you saying that the one percent trapicamide is okay to use on patients who have an angle closure? Well, well, then let's the, it, first. I would suggest half percent instead of one percent. Um, and people it, it, at that point, for people with just regular glaucoma, most the vast majority of people in the U.S. have primary open angle glaucoma. Not a problem. Dilation makes no difference. We do it all the time. You know, we that's the way we have to assess them. Angle closure. If somebody says, I have angle closure glaucoma and my doctor told me never to be dilated, that's somebody you should not dilate. I would agree. That's that rare instance that should be not. Now, there are those who have had angle closure and have had treatment for that. Um, and you can easily find that out by when you go to your eye doctor, do they dilate your pupil when you're there? And if they say, yes, they dilate maybe my, my eyes when I'm there, they may have had angle closure, it's been treated appropriately, and now it is safe to dilate them. If they say, no, when I go to my eye care doctor, they will not dilate me and tell me I can never be dilated, then stay away from that. I, I would agree completely. And if you don't know, err to the side of not dilating them, obviously. Absolutely. I do just also want to mention some of our organizations have specific dilation drop recommendations in place. So obviously also make sure that you're aware of your organization's particular approach. Um, and as Dr. Gross mentioned, we recommend a 0.5% trapicamide solution, uh, although the question did mention a 1%. So just yeah, wanted there's to not a huge difference, but there is a, there's a little bit of a difference. All right. Um, we are still taking questions. I don't see any others pending. Dr. Gross, is there anything else you wanted to elaborate on or mention during the webinar? No, I, I just think, you know, as the clinician, to be real honest, Iris was started by a, a retina surgeon and and he I I I was he I've known him for a long time. And both of us were what we find is that there are a lot of people that would are that still walk into our offices with horrible loss of vision from diabetes just because they've never been checked. So the whole idea here was to keep that from happening. We, you know, that's not a good, you know, we don't like that to happen. And the whole idea here was to 
recognizing that people weren't going to their eye doctor the way they're supposed to, and to try to see if we could get a substantial number of patients who don't normally get eye exams to be evaluated so that we can find the disease and treat it early. It's amazing to me as I look through, there are still people who just walk in, you know, we walk in off the street and they have complete, you know, horrible disease that's totally done enormous amounts of damage that just if they would have been found earlier and treated earlier would never have happened. So that's why it's just so important to do this. Um, you're really doing a great service to your patients. And even in your care, in those patients where you're not sure how they're, you know, the, how they're doing, um, the eye really is a window. And if they're they have diabetic retinopathy, chances are they have damage to other their kidneys and their nerves and their hearts and everything else too. And it tells you that their control of their disease is not adequate yet, and that you know if we that that something needs to be done to get them under better control. So it, it really does tell us a lot by a very simple test. Um, beyond just the, the the impact on their vision. I could not have put it any better myself. Thank you so much, Dr. Gross. I don't see any other pending questions. So we will go ahead and conclude the webinar. But before we do, I just want to thank you for your time here today and for all the work you do for us at IRIS. We really appreciate you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful Friday. Bye, everyone. Thank you.